Professor Bruce Kogut, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for inviting me. We are here to talk about a program you help lead called BAID. BAID stands for Business, AI, and Democracy. I want to mention BAID as part of the hub, Columbia Business School's new think tank that explores the most pressing issues shaping the world today. The theme for the hub's inaugural term is business and society. It was selected because of the important role that the business world in general and business schools in particular play in society. And the hub currently aims to encourage fresh thinking around the future of capitalism, innovation for the betterment of society, and of course, business, AI, and democracy. So Professor Kogut, I think the very good place for us to start is what is the mission of BAID? Well, thank you for asking that, that start off question. It's BAID, as you know, is well, part of the hub. We call it a, a hublet, it's one of, the, one of the three. And it focuses on things which are touched upon in business schools uh, occasionally more than uh, before, and that is, of course, democracy. So you really cannot have a thriving capitalism without a strong uh, democracy to support the, uh, the institutions which make capitalism work in the, in the first place. So we took up seriously the challenge that BAID should have as a mission is to be a kind of a think tank to the, to the school. And think tanks usually have a aspect to it where people think, but they also go out there and they try to get these ideas out to people. They try to make a difference in people's lives or in the policies which are put out. So we, we do both. Uh, we have some uh, research going on. I say we, we're about three or four people, it includes uh, Andre uh, Simonoff or Dieter Johar, Andre Pratt, myself, and a bunch of other people who are part of the, the, uh, uh, the group. And we then put on uh, these events uh, to try to be impactful to the world, such as uh, working with Dear Mama, which is a cafe on the Manhattanville, which is a great setting. Um, we bring in people from around the university, uh, and we try to explain what we do and get their reactions to what we are th thinking about. Can you talk to us about the intersection of these three terms? Okay. Well, I see that with a smile on your face, Fahad, means that you say, wow, you know, yeah. democracy is a big topic. You know, AI is already, you know, a, a large one, and then business on, on top of it. So I could lie to you and say it's just the intersection of these three, but uh, but it's it's not. It's more. Uh, sometimes it, it goes off more towards democracy. Sometimes it's more in the AI uh, space itself. But there's usually is a pretty clear link in what they uh, in what they do. So AI is kind of a you know this, I would say it's a catch-all term because it does pick up other technologies, which some people would say is not part of uh, of uh, of uh, AI. But it's become kind of attached to those things which are relying upon you know, advanced uh, data technologies, which can either you know, find data um, and or also uh, create uh, and generate data, text, for example, being an example of that. And then democracy is usually, and I hear I will say this somewhat casually, is really about communication and about a bunch of people talking to each other. And they generate a lot of texts and other things to, uh, to do. So it's just kind of a happy you know, marriage, if you wish, to have people who really know how to study you know, natural processing languages as a, as a technique. And they also can uh, take up a, a, a democracy and put you know, this great new tool in our hands to work on the topic of democracy, which we all agree is something we're very worried about. You mentioned the events that you have. A few different ones were how to steer AI, age of algorithms, big data. You also have Russian media during the war, a Marshall Plan for a democratic Ukraine, the it's range. Big. It's big. Right. You know, they said, you know, give that man a hub and he will travel. So <laughs> that's, what, that's, what, uh, that's what happened. Um, so, um, you know, you, you understand this uh, uh, well. I mean, we are living in a very dynamic, uh, sometimes difficult world right now. And there are things which come up, which again, more, maybe more on the dem democracy side than on the AI side, and et cetera. So we are influenced by those uh, those issues. Uh, we were created, um, you know, just a few months after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, which is a an autocratic uh, dictatorship in many ways, uh, uh, and we felt the need to uh, respond to that because we were, uh, and I think still are, the primary. 
outlet for discussions on democracy at the business school. So that made sense for us to do it. And it involves misinformation. And the mis misinformation is just rich in the use of AI, these things called bots, which maybe we can talk about uh, later on. Um, so it also has you know, a component of AI, which is quite, uh, is quite important. Many people, like uh, Donnell Baird came in from Block Power, he's a graduate from here, and he talked about his company, which is a company which is trying to bring in you know, a greening in, of, of uh, space here in urban cities and, and, uh, and elsewhere. And part of that actually is AI. And uh, these are the ones you mentioned, by, you know, by people like Sandra Motz who talked about polarization, or Chris Whitten who talked about sort of the origins of data and how it's become increasingly more in the direction of, uh, of AI and what that, what that has meant uh, uh, for us. Do you like, the f do you like having this wide, this, this ocean of ideas? And yeah, this, I do, freedom I do. I think force, it forces people to be uh, richer in their thinking, more, more broad in their thinking, and, and hopefully to start thinking also about ways we can actually make some difference to uh, the policy implications or the business implications. Now, you and I first met in 2015. Yeah. I was a student yeah. in your strategy class. Right. You were an excellent course. student. Too. I appreciate that. What made you... Why is this something that you have taken on and are helping to build? Well, um, because it's, it, it really does have the things I enjoy doing. Uh, and one is I really do enjoy working with colleagues. Uh, and I always, I just, just learned so much by doing that. So I'm not in marketing. We have two people from, uh, from marketing, someone from economics. We've had, you know, someone from sociology spend uh, a year with us. We, we have, uh, you know, working with the Data uh, Science Institute and some uh, stuff we're doing over the next uh, few months. So we like the outreach. And we've worked with also, you know, with other institutions on, on campus. So the Harriman Institute, for example, or, or SIPA, or the Journalism School on a few times, what's called the Alliance which has to do with the uh, primarily the schools in France. Uh, we have a close relationship. Can't I, I, there's a limit with what you can do. I want you to give you that good news, uh, but you know you can do an awful lot with, when you work in partnerships and you work with people, and uh, and it makes it exciting for ourselves, uh, inspirational, and hopefully for the people who follow us too. Right. Yeah. At the time we're recording, we're just a, a, a week from. President Biden signing executive order on safe, secure, trustworthy artificial intelligence. Right. The order calls for a society-wide effort that includes government, the private sector, academia, and civil society in order to realize the benefits of AI while mitigating risks. Why is it important that any governance of this technology be influenced in some degree by society as a whole? Well, you know, that's a great question. Um, you know, business, the Columbia Business School it, has a really long um, relationship uh, with working with you know, various actors in society, uh, obviously with business, um, but also with government, uh, for, uh, for that matter. And it was stronger, you know, maybe, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, going back to the 30s uh, even, when some great figures were, were, were here and made huge differences to uh, policies and went off to become, you know, engaged in making policy in, in Washington and, and elsewhere. And some people, you know, are still here, you know, uh, working with governments very clearly, you know, closely, and some want to dream of doing that, you know, in terms of, of, their, uh, of what they want. So it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it's not entirely new. It's a bit like if, you know, if you look at the, the long-term trends over time, it's kind of an, it kind of sways a little bit. And you can see why now it is so important because there's such fundamental issues coming up from so many different places. You know, it could be things on, you know, on, on just uh, inclusive uh, equity, which we talk about uh, uh, constantly. It's a, it's a huge pressure in American uh, society. Or it could be you know, technological, like AI and all the, and social media and how do you control social media and, and things on developing you know, systems which are used in the, in the military, but the private systems which are substituting for what is normally done by the, by the military. So there's so many points of contact, mm -hmm. uh, and this, our students are gravitating in this direction, that of course we have to be engaged in business and society. There's also sort of a, you know, a part of the cultural wars attached to it too. And it does, does seem like, you know, at a period of time that business, you know, maybe 30 years ago swung a little bit in one direction, 
and now it's swung back in the other direction, and maybe we're going to go through a little period of, of correction. I can see, if, imagine a few happy faces about the <laughs> correction part, and correction is probably always a good idea, no matter what direction you go in. Um, but we've been in that in that environment, so this, you know, people are demanding of companies to do more. They're demanding also of us to do more. And it took us a while as a business school to do that. We're probably were the first ones to react. But we've done a really good job uh, in catching up and leading in this area. Uh, and that's been a healthy thing for us to do. Yeah, there's some conversation around the use of AI in business and the ethical use of AI in mm -hmm. business. Do you think that the the pressure, if you will, that the business world feels to work in an ethical way is enough right now? The pressure that they're feeling from uh, their consumers, from the public to work in an ethical way is enough to, you know, to keep them from, keep them, keep them from work, keep them working in this way. Yeah, I mean, um, so I think one thing great about a democratic society uh, and about markets and capitalism for, the, uh, for that matter is that people have the freedom to choose where they want to end up working, uh, for whom and what kinds of people, et cetera. Now, maybe it's been a little bit, you know, irritating that uh, sometimes people lock into every firm has to act according to this code, mm -hmm. you know. Um, well, there should be some kind of moral code. Even in Milton Freeman's very famous article, on the purpose of business, he said, you know, there's a set of norms, and of course the law, within which the firms have to, uh, have to operate. But, he's, he, but Freeman did say, you know, the norms, he, wasn't, he didn't expect them to go out and, and do horrible things. He felt there would be sort of a moral background to it, which was, uh, which was important. So I think it's, you know, something which is absolutely, you know, critical for us to, uh, to be engaged in and to, uh, and to pursue. And, and, uh, but we should be aware of the fact that right now it really is part of a of the cultural, you know, um, struggle within the U.S. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's great. Uh, time is, you know, gets a little worrisome on it, but we'll certainly hear more about it in the year, in the next year, in terms of wh how people understand various issues, which we are, you know, deeply troubled by sometimes, but also inspired by. Well, I mean, if you those two different uh, feelings, troubled and, and uh, inspired. I listened to the talk that Professor Matz gave on big data, mm -hmm. and she made a great case of why big data is good, uh, the personalization part of it, but she also made the case of why people feel big data is a bad thing. And I wonder if we kind of think about artificial intelligence, is it is it harmful for democracy? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Just Generally, what is your take after well, being both. a part of this? It's both. You know, it's like, uh, I mean, you can ask about anything. You know, you can ask, you know, you know think about, you know, um, a car or, or a train, you know, or, you know, or photons. You know? <laughs> They're always, you know, <laughs> crashing into each other in one way or another, right? And you can do terrible things with cars, et cetera. Imagine we're driving cars, you know, in, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago when, you know, when uh, they, People didn't really know how to drive, you know. Uh, I'm not talking about it, not in the very beginning, but in the middle of it, people, you know, accidents were much higher in those periods of time, and we had debates around that. And we're having debates around AI in the same uh, in the same way. So this is an issue of governments. Now, this is where I think it's really interesting because I teach this class on um, on business and solving social problems, and I did this initially because it seemed like everyone, you know, often were split between two things: markets or running the government to solve the, to solve the problem. So the kind of business side was often uh, left out of the whole thing, as were also things called you know, the nonprofits and just the unions and whoever else were, were, uh, were there. So they were looking for solutions, but not looking sometimes you know, close enough to the business side of, all, uh, of, uh, of things. And I think this is where you have to get this coordination among these various actors to make you know, these big, uh, these big changes, uh, and we should bring people into it. AI is the same thing, so we do see, you know, you know, a lot of changes in AI uh, uh, over time, where people are picking up better, more and more, you know, what it's, you know, how it's working well, and how it's working badly. And some of this discussion is, you know, may, may surprise people because uh, engineers don't always kind of get the glory in the U.S. the way they do get it, like in France or almost everywhere else in the world. 
But engineers are, you know, were so slow to pick up on ethical discussions and what they were doing. But now there's, you know, it's really phenomenal what how engaged the engineering schools are because they're 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 designing tools which can be for the better or be for the for the uh, for the worse. So I do see us in this in this bait exercise as designing, you know, tools for democracy, often using AI technologies. That's where the kind of things we're thinking about these uh, these uh, these days. Because we should make sure we try to make it acting for the for for the better rather than for the worse, and that's a design problem which we should start off doing early rather than later. Uh, so it's up to us to uh, to take this under our control and make sure we are uh, making the decisions which will lead to a better AI than a than one we're actually afraid of. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? As part of Bade, are some of the positive use cases of AI. And what are some of the troubling areas in your, from your sure. perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's some things which don't trouble me so much. I mean, they trouble other, other people a lot. Um, although I will say uh, I've always been deeply um, worried about privacy. Um, so this was something which, uh, so I never got into Facebook, no, you know. Um, so, uh, and I missed out on all the family photographs and all the conversations and what people are saying about me and all that kind of stuff and so on. But I really stayed up. The only thing now I picked up recently is LinkedIn, which is kind of a, you know, a, a, cause such a boring media in some ways, but it's for people who, who, who were seeking either a job or, or some, you know, some recognition in, the, uh, in their careers. But, you know, it's something which I, I just didn't, you know, I, I was worried about that privacy issue. So, you know, the U.S. Um, was, you know, not early on thinking about these, uh, about this as a problem. Um, I think we're, maybe it's a discussion we can, ha we uh, will have, but I think that's an area where has, it has been dangerous, uh, and it still is potentially dangerous. Uh, and I don't think business, I think business in the pursuit of advertising, uh, you know, forgot its responsibilities in the terms of what was the actual content uh, in which these advertising were was was appearing, and that remains a huge debate. But if you look at you know elsewhere in the world, they have you know made some progress. They have, they led this out led this, you know, whereas the U.S. was still dragging its feet. Now people may say that's great. That's why the U.S. is doing so well, and et cetera. And that and that's a hypothetical, and it might be true. It probably has some truth to it, but it's probably not not really you know the full truth of what's uh, of what's uh, of what's happening. So it has both elements to it. It's good, you kind of like it, and it's got some bad things attached to it. Now going forward, what do we learn from this? You know, and we learn from this is that, you know, is that you know, having some public debate, and notice I didn't go right to the government, but some public debate around this issue, which business schools and universities in general should lead, uh, not in a, just a, you know, in a, in, a, in a way which they show that they are you know, constantly looking over their shoulders to see who's, who's following them, they should lead in terms of what the technology can't do and can do well. And we should have that, that, that debate. And it's hard for the university often to do that, you know, outside of, the, you know, the technologists, engineers, and the, the business schools, which can just be for business. Um, you know, we can, we can do this debate. Uh, but we have to remind ourselves here that we, it's okay for us to talk about, you know, the sort of moral, ethical aspects of what's being done. Um, and also what the policy consequences might be. Uh, uh, might uh, might be, and not not you know get back to a situation where you know we scare people so scared by it that the technology stops uh, in the in the first place. If you allow me, I'll give you another example. Please. You know, it's it's so there's been a lot of discussion about the substitution of people by machines. You know, so you know the answer to that that's, this has been going on for you know for 200 years and and uh, and uh, and more, um, and it's painful for people, and that's part of the aspects of. You know, a free market, or I wouldn't say this, I don't think capitalism is any longer a free market, but it's a, it's a market never, uh, nevertheless. You know, uh, it's just part of that's how change occurs. Uh, but you have to provide, you know, some understanding, usually we say of safeguards on that. But we're not very good as a country, and, it's, and very few countries are good at this, at retraining and repurposing people, particularly later in their, in, their, uh, in their careers. So you go off in this direction of, sure, I'd like to do that, but I can't do that. So it's got to be a different way of thinking about these problems. You just can't let people lose their job, you know, and, and be out of work and get one third of the wages they had be had before, and say, "Well, that's all in the name of progress." It's just, I mean, it doesn't sit well with with people. It doesn't sit well with me as a as a uh, 
as a, uh, as a solution. So there are things you can think about when, and some fields you know, are getting closer to the idea that you know, people can learn from machines, just as machines can learn from the data which humans actually uh, create uh, as well. This is how the you know, a par uh, part of AI uh, uh, works. And from that, actually, productivity goes up, maybe wages go up with that, and we have uh, kind of a win for, uh, uh, for everyone. You know, I was at a conference and I was listening to uh, Scott Belsky from Adobe, the chief strategy officer, I believe the chief strategy officer at, uh, at Adobe, and he was talking about AI, and he was saying that creativity is the new productivity. And what AI provides workers, any creator, any, any individual, is the ability to take what's in their mind's eye and actually see it. Mm -hmm. And to be able to use that to not just have 100 ideas, but 1,000 ideas or whatever it is, and then being able to pick and choose which of those ideas are you able to actually put into practice and then therefore elevate the work that you're doing. And I think that's an example of yeah. if it's used in partnership, if it's used as a tool, it's not going to broad stroke replace all of the workforce, but it's actually going to make workforces better. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, creativity is, is amazing. I was just thinking about this. Is you was, um, We talked earlier about, you know, uh, possible examples of, uh, of, of uh, we can point to. So I don't know if you had a chance to see this. The Museum of Modern Art was running on this big wall in the entry, you know, uh, uh, imaging coming out. You're using all the text, et cetera, uh, uh, which, is, which, uh, which they can find in, the, uh, in, in art and, and bro more broadly. And, you know, magnificent things. But, you know, it wasn't as if there was no human input. Of course, there's human input to, uh, uh, to this. Uh, and so I think creativity is an area, not always, where you can find exactly this combination of technology and people to uh, come out to a, a better solution and more democratic one, too. Based on the conversations that you're hearing through Bade, let's talk about deep fakes, for example. Right. You know, we talked about the, the great things that can happen, but now here's some of the dangerous. There's a dangerous element to it. Mm -hmm. What's the overall conversation there? Well, it's like, you know, as we both know, you know, deep fakes is, goes back to the beginning of, of, uh, of history. You know, it probably was some cave which was, you know, signed by, you know, some guy named Fahad, and there was, you know, it turns out to be the cave next door, which, uh, which was the original. So, um, the, um, no, I mean, I mean, this is, comes, I think, uh, to the issues of what's happened in Hollywood and, and, and elsewhere. And so in Hollywood, they used to say there's like 10, 10 kind of scripts you can write, you know, like, you know, boy leaves girl, girl leaves boy, and et cetera, and so on, very basic kind of, yeah. kind of stuff. Well, AI does, you know, has no problem doing that. Maybe it has even, you know, a list which is 100 things which they, uh, which they, uh, they uh, work on. So people are concerned about it. But the kind of good news is that, you know, since we're dealing with digital data, we can also do things, this is where the hope is, which will be able to stamp it a little bit better. For example, blockchain, which may be, you know, um, so, you know it, which is a digital way of, of just having a ledger and saying, you know, that I uh, sold you a car and you paid me for the car. But it also can be done for, you know, for writing as well. You can blockchain, which means that later on, if someone says, hey, I'm going to sue the hell out of you, being Hollywood, of course, that has to happen eventually. And they go back and they have the original there, and then you can compare it to, to what uh, someone else was, uh, was producing. The website for Bade, there's the following quote right at the top. This democracy is widely believed to be necessary for the sustainability of markets, that encourage investment and innovation to achieve private and social objectives. Underneath that, it says what seems to be uh, the statement is reading, surprisingly then, as political polling shows, democracies are living in a moment of crisis. Business is not isolated from these trends. If trust is lost in democracy, and there's arguments to be made that it has been or it is, can markets survive? Can society survive? And that's a, that's a huge question. So 
don't expect no, you to have the answer, but no, I'm smiling because uh, certainly I, uh, the bait is a big, is a big bucket right. already. Not right. this, this is <laughs> this is like you know the, the Great Lakes, but the uh, the um, but it's a good question uh, all the same. And that's what's fun about having you know to think about these uh, about these issues. So you know the so notice that the, the with that quotation and thank you for for reading that. Uh, uh, talks about public, about private and public, and also talks about the difference between economic and social sort of uh, aspects. And, I, and that didn't say governments necessarily. Um, and, it, and, I, and this is where we're gonna, we're gonna, we would get into a huge fight with people on, on this matter, particularly because there still is a lot of people who do believe in a 1930s regulatory system, which, which you can do more. But, but I'm not sure that's what people want now uh, on, on terms of what the majority wants. And it's always be protection of minority, as you know, but there's a majority issue. And nor am I so sure that it's actually needed the way it was uh, before, because people can be better informed about those things which they really care about. Again, there's this matching of, uh, of, uh, of interests. So, you know, it could be different forums for taking care of different kinds of problems rather than everything having going to the, the government itself. And for many things, that would make me feel a lot more comfortable because I don't know if, if, if politicians have the time, they don't. Whether they read it, they probably don't read it, most of the stuff they do. Whether they write it, they don't write most of the stuff they, uh, they, uh, they do. Uh, they're out you know, politicking, you know, as, as politicians do, and that's a worthwhile thing to, uh, to happen. But you just better pray that those staffers are good, you know, and those lobbyists are not so good, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, you know, I, so I think there is an, an aspect where, again, you have to think about you know, what are the problems, what are the aspirations, uh, and try to th think through, well, how would you then kind of use what you, what you have at hand or may have to solve these particular problems? You know, when McKinsey walks into a client, into a problem, they always ask themselves, so who is the client, right? And I think sometimes people, we walk into things, and we don't ask the question, so what's the problem, mm -hmm. you know? And the problem of democracy may not be just, you know, Washington, you know, uh, this as an easy case to make, perhaps, but it, maybe it has to do a little bit with the population as well. Why we're not more engaged as we get larger, and you know, countries get larger and cities get larger. How do you get your voice heard? How do you get a, how do you get the response? So that's what we have to work out, we, and that's what we and it's happening in many ways. Sometimes not involving a lot of technology. Sometimes you know, actually involving exactly the things we have been been talking uh, been talking through. Uh, and you know it's just super exciting and interesting, and and uh, and I think that that in the future this will be part of uh, part of what we see. Well, if you think about the future, maybe you know your legacy with Bade. What do you hope is the problem that Bade solved? <laughs> uh, I think that uh, we will. Uh, this is a short time to be, you know, uh, in in existence, and we were the. You know, first generation of, of the hubs, um, so we had you know we we kind of like we we're, we were kind of running into walls at first, but you probably we all know that experience in life. Um, but then we got through with a lot of good good people helping us out, and and that's been uh, that's been great. But you know, I think you know I think what we've been good at doing is is you know is building up a set of of research which takes a little longer to happen than people you know uh, realize. Um, we work really well as, as a group. Um, we actually did have, you know, uh, experience working before uh, as a group because we did something over the journalism school on some of these issues, which, and all that, all that helps. But I think what we really are trying to create is, is this platforms, with an S, you know, of how we can create multiple venues for people to meet and come together. We'll maybe, you know, maybe, you know start it out with, some ideas and what we're doing, and, and also very aware of defending research, because I, sometimes I feel like we cave in sometimes uh, too much uh, in these, uh, these situations. And, uh, and, and showing how we can collectively solve the, these problems uh, as, uh, and, move, and move forward. So I think that's the legacy, is, is, is these platforms and communication, a, a greater you know, uh, uh, confidence that we can have you know, a, a excellent quality uh, discussion with multiple actors, diverse backgrounds of, of people, and do it in the in the public light. Bruce, I want to maybe ask you a lot of the things that you're talking about, and this is you know very much 
um, to you and the team's credit, you're bringing things up that in your in your sessions that are current. And it seems as if in the world we're living in today, things that we're talking about, regardless of what they are, are polarizing to some degree. There's there, how is it that you all are protecting the conversations, the 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 ability for people to share their their ideas in the spirit of the hub? Well, right. I mean, I think uh, I mean, uh, it does go back to trust. Um, you have to establish trust among uh, each other that you can speak openly, et cetera. I mean, there. Look, you know, um, uh, cultures differ. Um, Across countries, it also differ across schools and, and industries and all that kind of uh, that kind of stuff. So um, you know, you walk into again to, to choose Hollywood. You know, people yell at each other from what I can understand. They get you, or they have pretty serious arguments because they have different ideas and views, and they have kind of you know artistic and, and uh, engagement in the whole thing. Well, you know, we are you know people are surprisingly passionate about the work which they actually they do. Um, and people in, the, in academics, they also argue about that. And lawyers argue about that clearly. And other fields do. So when people get close to what is, you know, is meaningful to them, then they begin to, to speak up. Now, will they speak up in front of a public audience? You know? um, and that's what we have to kind of create uh, in this environment. I, mean, I did have an experience once. I'm not sure if this is entirely relevant. But you know, I was asked by um, the Rothschild Foundation, one of the Rothschild family, to do something on on dialogue between religions. That's something I knew an awful lot about. I just ran the part dealing with enter, en, entrepreneurial efforts and et cetera, and that was the context. So I had to you know, walk through this myself, and, and you, know, you kind of realize this, it's easy to learn you know, what your algorithm is and what my algorithm is. It's really hard to learn what's your world perspective and how to engage that and have a conversation with that. So we kind of we have to do that as a uh, as you know as a society, is to have these to respect these different uh, perspectives, and these different voices which come into play, to feel confident enough in our what what we want, and the, uh, and yet and have a dialogue go uh, go uh, forward. They do these experiments. Uh, this guy named Fishkin over at Stanford has done these things on deliberative democracy, which is a big thing in Europe and also increasingly in the U.S. And they find out, you know, can you get people to change their minds? And, and, the, and there are maybe some, you know, uh, experiments, et cetera, say you can get people to change their mind. There's not a lot of evidence to that, really. But, you know, it's really, because there's probably a reason why people have, have those views, you know. Uh, there's a reason why you, you know, may not be able to articulate it, but why am I, you know, voting for this person this year who doesn't look like the person I voted for last year? I'm looking at it in terms of the ideas that person brings. So, you know, but what we can do is to develop greater tolerance to have that discussion. So uh, people walk away saying, you know, I, I heard, you know, Bruce speak, and I thought, you know, he was entirely wrong and that, and that but, but I, get, I get what he was saying, you know. So, uh, by listened. By listening. Engage, we're really engaging each other. And we all know that emotions matter a lot to this, to, uh, uh, to engagement. So you have to be willing to, to take that all in, not every moment of your life, you, you know. Uh, but well, that should be part of the experience inside of schools. We all know the best teachers are people who usually who have moved you in some, in somewhere along the, along the way. So it sticks in your, uh, in your mind. Now, if the students would only remember the name of the professor who, who did that, that would be, uh, be great. But, uh, but, you know, that's, that's, true. Uh, that's true in general. Well, maybe we'll end on you know, some, that, that, this optimistic feeling. You're an optimistic guy. We're an optimistic show. Yeah, what, I believe in optimism too. Yeah. And what, so, what excites you about the intersection of business AI and democracy? Uh, I like learning things, so I, I have you know, you know, probably more than probably people think is a is a good thing to do. You know, spend a lot of time just you know working through what AI does. You know, when the doors are closed and you have to you know work with it. Um, but I also think about these other issues. You know, we didn't, you know, there's a language of about, you know, alignment and about, you know, fairness, which which comes up, or explainability, all these terms which come up. And they're very interesting to follow through. Um, so part of me just enjoys learning that kind of uh, that kind of stuff. But I also, you know, um, think that, you know, as an optimist, uh, 
that uh, we have the ability to collectively solve problems. You know, not just you know sometimes a person stands up there and says, you know, I did this, and we have to do this when we're running for election or we're selling ourselves for a job or whatever. But I think you know creativity more so than ever, uh, and probably maybe it was always been true. It's just people coming together and you know sharing their ideas for a collective good, hopefully a collective good, uh, and makes you know it impactful on uh, on the on the people who need it the most. Um, and I think it's good to think about those uh, about those issues, and I'm always excited by that. Well, Professor Kogut. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rahat. Appreciate being here.